Hello and welcome. If we look disorganized, that's probably because we are a little disorganized. But the whole idea is this is a, a round table. Where it's kind of, okay, it's a, an oblong table, but anyway. It's meant to be very discussion-based. So although the people to my left and right have a lot of things to say and a lot of stuff to present on, we're going to keep presentations to a minimum. Um, so no more than, you know, a couple of minutes, five minutes, something like this. So almost like position papers or lightning talks, think of them like that. Uh, we also have a couple of contributors online who will, who have, I think already sent in their uh, five minute talks. And then after that is the discussion. So if you can do your maths, which I'm now gonna struggle to do, that's a long time for discussion, okay? That's, that's the point. I'm chairing this, so I have, I have a microphone for myself. Um, the speakers will pass the microphone to each other as they do the presentations. And then I'm hoping there'll be lots of uh, interaction in the audience and I will come with a microphone. So to break down the barrier between uh, panelists and audience, that's the idea. Of course, I should have said to begin with uh, what this panel is about. It's about the Pelagios network. Some of you may have heard about Pelagios, some of you may not. I, I'm not gonna presume any uh, prior knowledge. Pelagios was an initiative uh, that started in 2010 um, to make use of the extraction of place name information in texts um, or in, the, in images and use that as a linking mechanism to connect different online documents. So you can think of Pelagios as a, a linked open data infrastructure project in a way. That's the initial um, idea of it. Started in 2010 with the um, oof, lights, we have lights. It started in 2010 uh, with a couple of uh, UK based funders. Um, its main funding came from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Funding finished in 2019. So that's important, that's the first thing. The, the first take home point is that Pelagios has not existed as a project with funding since 2019. And yet, here we are. And so the, the question is, or you, you should have is, why are we here? What's happened? Um, part of that final phase of funding was about trying to move towards a degree of sustainability, and um, a status of st sustainability without core funding. It would be wrong to say that there's no funding, but the funding is distributed through the network. So from being a core team of, let's say, five or six people being funded directly by a particular grant, Pelagios is now a network of partners. Anyone can join, it's very easy. So um, uh, this is, hopefully this talk or this round table won't put you off from wanting to join us. Maybe it will, I don't know. Um, but it's free. Uh, you have free access to all the expertise and experience in the network, a lot of which you're going to um, hear from today, from my colleagues here, but also many Pelagios partners I see in the audience as well. But it's also important to say that it's more than just a talking shop. Yes, the, um, it's based around the idea of having core activities and core activity meetings around critical issues relating to place linked data. So things like annotation, gazetteers, because, uh, sorry, I should say the Pelagios method of annotation is very lightweight. It's not like the CDOC CRM. We're not asking you to change the way you represent your information, but rather put a hook in it. Um, the, that process is through semantic annotation. So annotation is a core activity. Gazetteers, because it's place-based. Visualization, trying to make sense of this for an audience. Why is linked data interesting, for example? Registry, which is the more technical backbone behind that. And I'm missing one. Red, um, no, no, gazetteers, annotation. Time, uh, oh yeah, time. Yeah, we, to, as, and that, that's not, um, yeah, it's um, not coincident because time has just joined us. So we were, as it were, um, we were just focused on place link data, but apparently the way that we do things was interesting for other folks too. So the time people uh, thought, hey, we want a piece of this action as well. And so they've recently joined us. So Pelagios is no longer just about place. So there's also time stuff. And the other important thing to say is that there's a development of tools 
and methods in association with it. So you can think of Pelagios as an infrastructure project, a social infrastructure project, perhaps above all, but also an ecosystem of developing methods and tools that each partner contributes to through their own funding. So I mentioned before, there's no core funding, but each partner, of course, comes with their own funding, whether that's actual money for development or um, person time, people willing to contribute according to their work. And people do this to benefit their own work, but also to benefit the community. So I think, in many ways, this is a very good example, I would say, of collaboration, which is the, the theme of the conference. I've already sp spoken for too long. My job is a chair, so I really want to pass things over now to uh, the partners here, who will give a little bit of background to their own projects, um, why they join Pelagios, um, why they think it's great, why, what's the problem with it, apart from me talking too long. So let me pass over. Uh, also, it'd be great if you could introduce yourselves uh, first, and then, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, so my name is Elisa Nuri. I work as a researcher at the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics in the DH Plus group for the Mark 16 project. And so Mark 16 is the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and it's uh, an enigma of textual criticism because there are several different endings uh, describing what happens uh, after the tomb of Jesus is found empty on the Easter Monday. And so in the shortest form, the gospel ends with the women discovering the empty tomb and they flee and say nothing to anyone because they are afraid, which uh, is being considered as the original ending because it's found in some of the most uh, ancient Greek manuscripts. But uh, admittedly, from a narrative point of view, is not very satisfying. <laughs> so uh, there are longer endings that describe the appearance of Jesus who sent the disciples through the world to preach the good news. And so the purpose of Mark 16 is to provide the portal of reference in uh, this topic, and it's really been a project focused on collaboration uh, with more than 20 scholars who tr contributed with uh, transcriptions and translations of manuscripts in 11 languages. And so for us, it was not a question that we also wanted to collaborate on the map, map visualization project with the Pelagius Network, also to follow the standards and the good practices of the community. And so we wanted to have this map for two reasons. And the first was to highlight our library partners. And we really wanted to show them as an equal research partner in the project. And the second reason was to um, break a little bit the norm of New Testament research, because usually the manuscripts, they are classified according to the language in which they are written. And the Greek is the most important, of course. And all the rest comes after uh, like not uh, as important and it's not studied. And so simply showing them in alphabetical order, <laughs> uh, we are putting first other languages like Arabic, uh, Armenian, um, Aramean, and so on. And it was really a small technical change, but a big revolution for New Testament studies <laughs> to see the, the manuscripts presented like this. And so for this panel, I would share in the discussion around the theme of sustainability through a community of, of good practices and also explaining how we have worked to adapt Peripleo for our needs, what sort of questions we have faced, and uh, also we are happy to say that our small work uh, is already contributing to the biggest community because we have one case of uh, reuse, <laughs> of someone who reused our, our version of uh, Peripleo. So and that's it for me. Hi, I'm Sarah Middle. I'm a postdoctoral researcher on the Tools of Knowledge project. Um, and I'm also presenting on behalf of my colleagues Duncan Hay from UCL and Alex Butterworth from the University of Sussex. Um, Tools of Knowledge, modelling the creative communities of the scientific instrument trade in Britain, 1550 to 1914, is an AHRC funded project in the UK. Um, started in January 2021 and we've just been extended so it now goes up to um, December of this year. Um, it's a collaboration between National Museum Scotland, University of Sussex and the University of Cambridge and we're working with partner institutions, Science Muse Museum and Royal Museums Greenwich. At the heart of the project is um, the conversion of a legacy access database 
into an events-based linked open data structure on the lives and works of um, scientific instrument makers um, during our time period. Um, I'm going to be talking more about that tomorrow, um, but today I'm going to focus more on the work we've been doing alongside that in reflecting on the processes of converting this data and the infrastructure um, to support it. Um, so the problems that we found with infrastructure are partly technical. So, for example, what systems are available? Um, there are quite a few systems to support um, a linked open data system, um, linked open data structure. Um, but also, how do we decide between them? Um, and what are the different sort of factors? And this often has involved balancing our research needs um, with the idea of needing sustainable infrastructure. So we need something that will technically do what we want but also will stand the test of time and will be able to be managed by Royal Museums Greenwich, who has agreed to host our infrastructure after the project has ended. Um, and it's also social, um, so how is it supported? So who is there to actually support um, the data conversion and its long-term sustainability? Um, where's my slide? <laughs> um, and how we share our knowledge of best practice and how we navigate the linked open data landscape. Um, so our reflections on this subject led to an activity at last year's Link Plasters conference um, called Infrastructures for Managing and Publishing Large Heterogeneous Linked Data Sets. Um, so we led this activity um, at the Link Plast conference in York um, last November, which had asynchronous and in-person components, um, which included presentation and discussion sessions. Uh, we drafted a white paper in advance of this session, um, but we then, uh, following our discussions, we then revisited the white paper, wrote up the results of our discussions, and then we've shared that again for further comments and contributions. So the link is, oh, I haven't changed the slide. <laughs> um, the link's up there, um, so please do have a look if um, you'd like to see what we found or if you'd like to contribute. Um, it's open for anybody to make contributions or we have a template document as well to make it easier for you to contribute. Um, we shared that with the Plagios community um, in June and um, it's now been shared wi um, more widely um, on Twitter and um, through Daria as well. So yeah, please, please do have a look if you're interested. Um, but for now, our key findings, which are really more questions, um, are how to make the linked open data landscape more navigable. Oh, sorry, didn't bring the slides on as well. <laughs> Difficult having two computers. Um, so how to make the linked open data nav landscape more navigable. Um, it can be quite niche technology, and it's difficult to understand the landscape and to navigate it for newcomers. And what we found particularly is there's quite a lot of information out there about what linked open data is and how to kind of construct RDF very basically, but not that many in-depth case studies that actually explore how that's done in practice. Um, and another question we had was what could we as a community borrow from more mainstream development practices to ease onboarding? Um, also how to choose linked open data infrastructure. Um, there are different versions of what these implementations look like. Some of them consist of a triple store, um, some of them consist of an ontology, um, some of them consist of, um, <coughs> of, of a hybrid model such as Arches, which is what we've ultimately chosen to use for tools of knowledge um, for various reasons, mostly to do with sustainability and ease of maintenance. And then finally, how to square research funding models with the problems of sustaining infrastructure. So how we could make project-based funding models work better for digital humanities research in general, as well as our specific problem with linked open data, and what alternatives would there be to project-based funding? Um, and <laughs> Hi, I'm Ann Chen. Um, I am here representing uh, the International Digital Dury Ropos Archive. Um, and also my colleagues, uh, Adnan al Mohammed, who works with me on that project, and Miranda Williams out of Oxford University, who works on the Manor al Athar project. But actually, I'm not going to be talking about a, um, anything to do specifically with the, the methods or uh, aims of our independent projects, but really the, the intersection that uh, was kind of highlighted uh, as a byproduct. So since it's a quickly maturing and therefore ever-changing ecosystem, uh, 
digital humanists working with linked open data often face a certain amount of struggle in kind of figuring out how to apply emerging technical methods to their particular data sets and uh, their humanities related questions. So one of the major um, benefits of the Pelagios network uh, from our perspective is the uh, international membership and the online meeting structure actually ends up offering digital humanists kind of the safe space where they can come to confer with a thriving community of practice, not just to kind of tout their project's uh, successes, but also to consult on unresolved issues and other kind of naughty project challenges. Um, with the introduction of digital methodologies into humanities disciplines, one of the things that we don't often reflect upon is the fact that this sense of strangeness or destabilization in, in the how-to of our very research has necessitated this kind of repeated consultation with a broader community uh, long before you get to project completion. And that closer contact with other practitioners then offers insights into the larger research community needs beyond the narrow view of your own particular endeavor. And that's a strength that I think DH methods have over more traditional humanistic practice. You know, if we think of traditional humanists uh, in, in the narrow model, you know, for generations they've been working in a rather solitary uh, way. So you get that single scholar who kind of uh, thematically collects related content, reads the previous scholarship, um, makes an editorial or interpretive decision, and then hopefully synthesizes and publishes, sometimes maybe not. Um, but it's, it's in that kind of pipeline, you really only, uh, in the rather mature stages of research, uh, have an interface with an intellectual community. You know, maybe, maybe in a, a lead up to publication, you get like a conference presentation or something like that. Um, and because of that, how often then have humanities scholars ended up kind of unnecessarily reinventing the wheel or else worked at cross purposes uh, thanks to that traditional research infrastructure? So as Elton has already said, under the Pelagios network umbrella are these different activities that serve as working groups and communities of consultation for partners with a shared interest in various aspects of linked open data. Um, the two independent projects that uh, uh, are represented in this particular uh, portion are both members of Pelagios's annotation activity. Um, Miranda Williams is the deputy director of Manor al Athar, which is uh, University of Oxford's first of its kind photographic database with searchability in English and in Arabic. And uh, myself and Adnan al Mohammed represent, as I said, the IDEA project which is using linked open data methods to digitally re, uh, reassemble and recontextualize an important Syrian archeological site uh, and doing that in both English and Arabic. In our case, it was only as a consequence of the Pelagios network talks from projects in progress. So these are reports on incomplete work, uh, kind of questions unresolved, that the um, Manar al-Athar and IDEA teams came to realize that we'd each been thinking of something as a byproduct of the day-to-day -day churn of work toward you know, each project's stated goals. So uh, an internal work product, if you will, that was started without a notion of its utility beyond making a particular task possible in our case. Um, this was in fact something that with very little additional work uh, beyond what we were already doing for our own purposes, could be shared in a way that could benefit uh, the broader linked open data community and a linked open data community that's highly dominated currently by voices from the global north. So more specifically, both projects were conceived to share out imagery and information related to cultural heritage in the Middle East. And while both were connected with making sure that content was available to users in English and in Arabic, neither considered itself in the business of providing authoritative English and Arabic cultural heritage vocabulary equivalents. But each of us independently discovered that in the process of providing metadata, um, content and labels in translation for our own projects, we were forced to do quite a bit of linguistic disambiguation. So for instance, uh, in English we have independent words for the lower part of a doorway, a threshold, uh, and the upper part, a lintel. But in Arabic, there's only a single word for both concepts. Different but similar, uh, in English, the word bolt can refer to a kind of arrow and a part of a locking mechanism for a door. Um, 
it was through Miranda's presentation on Manoral Athar's work in progress to the annotation activity that IDEA became aware that Manoral Athar had already started their own list of troublesome terms like this and their project's editorial decisions about how to translate them. So then learning of this shared problem, it dawned on us that if each of our projects was benefiting from the shared effort of one other project, conceivably there's many projects uh, of which we aren't aware or that could come into being in the future that could be given a leg up by our combined work in this direction. So our solution to this process was very simple and barely more than either of us was already doing on our own. Um, previously, each project was keeping track of vocabulary judgments in an internal workspace, a Word doc for Man Al-Athar -Al and a Google Sheet for IDEA. Our big intervention was then to combine these independent workspaces into a single CSV and then to link each of the uh, English-Arabic value pairs to a corresponding Getty Art and Architecture thesaurus definition and stable URI. So those of you in cultural heritage and museum studies uh, will probably know the Getty AAT. It's a widely, controlled, uh, widely used controlled vocabulary uh, for glam and cultural heritage, and it does the job of disambiguating between vocabulary terms related to art and architecture. And while the Getty project has done an admirable job of aligning each English language vocabulary concept with the terms for the same concept in other world languages, Western European languages are best represented and Arabic terms are virtually non-existent. So our collaborative spreadsheet of English and Arabic value pairs aligned now to Getty's AAT will be absorbed by the Getty project so that others can benefit from the labor that's already done rather than reinvent the wheel. So the Bellagio's network fosters a lot of uh, big ticket outputs, some of which uh, you've already heard touted, but no less to be celebrated are those um, kind of smaller aha moments that move us incrementally toward um, that mutual goal of more open and ethical sharing of good quality data. Um, the collaborative network or the collaborative work I've described today was something that was unanticipated by either project as a deliverable, but it's actually probably going to be one of the broadest impacts that either of our independent projects uh, will have. And it was an opportunity that was born out of collaboration, which is the theme that brought us all together uh, here in Graz. So, thanks. Thanks. Um, so my name is uh, Tom Geldof, and I'm here uh, to represent the Tris Megisos project, which I think if you have a background in ancient history like myself or archaeology or Egyptology might sound familiar uh, to you, but if not, I can try to quickly introduce it. In a nutshell, it's uh, an interdisciplinary portal. It's an interdisciplinary portal of the ancient world. So it consists of um, many uh, sub pages, uh, which, of which you can see a few on the right side of this slide. Uh, that all contain metadata about ancient world texts. They are interlinked uh, via the so-called uh, Trismegistos or TM identifiers in the form of URIs. And ideally, it's in the making, they all form a linked open data ecosystem that is accessible via APIs. Today, I will focus on uh, the gazetteer we have, which is called uh, Trismegistos Places and uh, consists of ancient world toponyms. This actually also arose, like the rest of the project, from a prosopographic uh, project about Ptolemaic Egypt, but it rapidly expanded uh, from Egypt to the rest of the ancient world, and it's also still uh, under construction. At the moment, we have some, uh, a little over 61,000 places that are in uh, term linked to about um, 233,000 attestations of these place names mentioned in ancient sources and also to close to a million uh, provenances of where these texts were either found or written or both. Um, we also tackled this project from the beginning with a linked open data uh, approach or at least that's what we try to do. As you can see here, I put just the example as I do always when I'm in a uh, in a conference uh, location with uh, the, the name of the city itself. So uh, Graz also uh, is present in the Trismegistos Gazetteer, has an identifier, 
um, has some attestations in the portal that refer to texts that were either uh, found or written or mentioned, uh, I assume mostly uh, in, in Latin inscriptions. And so as you can see, Trismegistos also, um, besides assigning identifiers, also functions as a kind of aggregator to other gazetteers and projects might be familiar projects like Wikidata or Wikipedia or a uh, very niche uh, database projects like, for example, the, the Heidelberg database of uh, uh, epigraphy. Um, and the way we tried to open up that data was uh, through um, APIs. Um, so the data itself is available uh, to download as GeoJSON, a form of JSON-LD, but you can also just download a CSV data dump or you can directly use uh, the API to, um, well, uh, query the, the entire gazetteer uh, with a few parameters of which I think the, um, the links, the uh, geo relations, uh, links to other gazetteers is maybe the most useful uh, at this moment. And so that's actually also um, how we used uh, the Pelagios network and how I hope the Pelagios network could also benefit from uh, our uh, expertise and our data. We tried to make this linked open data usable. So this loud acronym um, is also uh, something that emphasizes the usefulness of linked open data. So it's not uh, sufficient to just put it out there and hope that people will come to you and, and start using the data. Sometimes you also have to give a little nudge, um, maybe in the form of uh, well-written documentation, maybe also with a few best practices or concrete examples. And I know this slide uh, looks a bit messy, so I just try to um, show a couple of examples in one slide, which I hope is still readable. Quickly going over them, on the um, left top side, you have the World Historical Gazetteer, which we actually came in contact uh, with via the Pelagios network. So Carl, the developer, is here at the front, and we are all part of uh, the Gazetteer activity. We're also working together uh, for the Pelagios registry activity. And I think, if I remember uh, correctly, Carl, we just during a coffee break at one of the Link Plus events started uh, talking about how we could better connect uh, different gazetteers and that's actually how we are now in the process of uh, reconcili reconciling our um, these ambiguous place names via the World Historical Gazetteer using uh, the Wikidata IDs. Um, I think on the uh, bottom you see another example, the Heidelberg uh, database of epigraphy or the epigraphic database Heidelberg, they actually use our API to uh, query live all of the relations we, um, we have to other uh, projects. So the moment we update it on our part, this is also uh, directly updated on their website without them having to interfere or update their own database. It's just based on the link, the Trismegistos identifier they have um, mapped in their database. On the right bottom side, you see the Peripleo, or at least the old uh, Peripleo visualization, in which uh, different um, projects could also be queried in one and the same uh, map interface. And uh, if I'm well informed, there is now a new version, a Peripleo Lite version, that is also uh, very uh, user-friendly for uh, projects to add their data to. Then, uh, I'm, I'm not going to into all of them, but there are uh, other um, scripts written by individual researchers, sometimes without us even knowing that they existed. So sometimes you just stumble upon them when you are <laughs> uh, browsing uh, GitHub, for example. And then ending with the image on the, um, on the top right, you see this kind of ecosystem that has been formed uh, not in the least thanks to uh, all of the uh, Pelagios network activities and events. So in a way, we are all connected. We are all trying to uh, connect, trying to make this linked open data we create in our different projects more usable, making it more usable. We do it in the form of APIs, but I'm sure that during the discussion we will um, discuss other best practices and of course not to forget uh, a lot of challenges of which uh, Sarah I think already named uh, a few. So I think I will conclude here and... Thanks Tom. Like to and I believe we have two presenters online. Let's see if this works.
the Austrian Institute of Technology, that is Reiner's um, affiliation, and colleagues of PANA. My name is Valeria Vitale, and with my colleagues Katie McDonough and Reiner Simon, we would like to um, say a few words about a project that reused and customized some of the um, Pelagius tools. Our project is called Machines Reading Maps. Uh, it is an international collaboration that involves a number of institutions, including the Alan Turing Institute, where Katie, who is the PI of the project, and myself uh, were based, uh, but also the Austrian Institute of Technology, that is Reiner's um, affiliation, and colleagues from the University of Minnesota and University of Southern California. So very briefly, uh, the aim of this project was to use machine learning to uh, collect the text on large digitized collections of uh, maps. But we're not here to talk about machines reading maps specifically, uh, although we think that it's a quite exciting project, so feel free to check it out. What we want to focus on is um, the role that Recogito had in this project. So um, to complement our machine learning pipeline that is called Map Curator, we also needed an interface that um, uh, we could use to manually create gold standard annotation to evaluate the performance of the machine learning algorithm. And Recogito was already a very good uh, fit for our project, but we wanted something that was even more tailored to our specific needs. So um, what Rainer, Rainer did was uh, developing a new version of Recogito specific for maps uh, that has a few extra features compared to the regular Recogito, like for example more drawing tools, a grouping feature and some extra uh, visualization um, options. But one of the interesting things that we saw when we made this available was that um, it was it turned out to be even more useful than we thought at the beginning. And on top of using it for its main purpose, people became interested in using this new Recogito to edit and correct the um, automatically generated annotations. So we decided that it could be a good idea to bring those two um, to together in a single um, interface that integrated Recogito and uh, Map Curator. And we really like this kind of modular uh, approach where we can uh, add or sometimes subtract um, uh, some features so that um, we can build um, um, a combination of tools that is really specific for our project. And this is very much uh, something that happened in a further collaboration of our project with the um, David Ramsey Map Collection and with the Luna Imaging team. And together, uh, we were able to actually make a subsection of the David Ramsey map collection um, available for the users to search by words. And the role of Recogito in this is that a very simplified version, a minimal uh, annotation interface has been embedded in the Luna viewer so that users can use this minimal annotation interface to edit the automatically generated annotations. And we think that this is a quite exciting opportunity for us. It is sort of a new adventure in, the, um, in our experience um, in using annotation for engagement. And we hope that this will be as successful as the um, other opportunities that we had in the past, where we have seen people really, really um, engaging with the annotation of historical documents. So uh, not only machines reading maps uh, reused um, in two occasions um, uh, versions of Recogito, but we think uh, that perhaps more importantly, the project really is part of that kind of um, sustainability through development and through resharing that the Pelagius network wants to promote. And we think that we have um, learned something during this process and there are a couple of things that we would like to discuss further with you uh, during the panel. 
And one is that we think that it's really important that uh, the development happens in a multidisciplinary environment. Um, and of course, that documentation is key, but this documentation has to be truly uh, accessible. And of course, we are very keen on creative reuse and we would like to be surprised and discover uh, new ways in which what we have created and reshared can be reused by other projects. And also that is always best to maximize our effort collaborating and even applying together for uh, grants so that we can strengthen the case of uh, support. And of course there are also a few issues that we still need to uh, figure out and we would very much welcome your thoughts around them and one is uh, well what is going to happen with all the annotations that we are creating who is going to archive them and maintain them and to what document will they be um, tied and so on. And also that to uh, support collaboration, we also need opportunities to um, discuss our work in progress very, very informally. And the Pelagius Network has provided some of these opportunities through the um, uh, activities meetings, but it would be even better to uh, find uh, more of these opportunities. So this was um, a brief introduction to machines reading maps and we look forward to joining the discussion later. So I think you, you've, all, you've got the picture. <laughs> There's Hi a lot everyone, of work. thanks for having us with you, even yeah. though just in spirit. Yeah, that's, that's actually very helpful just to show the, the other partners who are involved, who, who wanted to be here, but unfortunately couldn't be. So, so that's great. I think you've got the picture that there's a lot of uh, work going on. That work is very varied, and yet there are various points of contact with the work. And there's this uh, being able to uh, work in, um, in the round, as it were, with connections to each other, enables each, individual, each individual's project to progress in a way that they perhaps hadn't anticipated. And I think um, particularly Anne gave a very good example of, of that in her work. Um, what we really like now is a discussion. So um, if you have any questions about anything that you've heard so far, um, whether that is a particular individual project that you'd like to learn more about, or the bigger issues that hopefully this panel is trying to address, issues relating to multidisciplinarity, that's one of the key terms, collaboration, um, sustainability, tool development, standards, linked data, any of these, any of these things we would welcome uh, comments or, or questions about. So don't be shy, and I will come with a microphone. Oh, maybe, maybe that's threatening, I don't know. Maybe to start, we already have two questions in the document. Oh, fantastic, that's great. I can read them. So the first question is for Anne and Miranda. Uh, is this spreadsheet available for sharing? Um, I think the archive of Libyan documents in Leicester may also be interested, or at least uh, should be aware of it. We would love that. Uh, we are not currently in, in contact with them and it's just our two projects that are uh, contributing to it, but we would love to share it with more. It's just a Google spreadsheet, as I said, and it will be absorbed. We've already um, created a pipeline with the, the Getty Museum, uh, well, the, the Getty um, uh, Art and Architecture vocabulary. Um, but yeah, please uh, drop me an email. And then the second question is a bit related, or well, it's about uh, the concept of uh, linked open usable data, the LOUT acronym that is very much tied to uh, linked art and IIIF uh, for the moment. And the question is uh, how we should move forward uh, to collect all community-led standards that identify as LOUT, I think. 
this might be a question for all of us. Uh, <laughs> I must admit that I'm not an expert, so I, I have been using the acronym as a kind of way to make people, make colleagues, uh, researchers aware that there's a difference of just creating linked open data and hope that it will suddenly uh, be used by, by other projects, um, make them aware that you should invest time in writing uh, uh, documentation that is readable, so not just uh, put it somewhere uh, on a GitHub page and hope that everyone reads it. Uh, these best practices, I think I already um, showed a few uh, in my presentation. So that's the way how we are doing. I think maybe in the in the IIIF community, uh, at least uh, to my knowledge, there are um, a few very uh, good projects that are implementing this uh, as we speak. So um, I'm looking at my colleagues and maybe Anne uh, can also uh, give some more information. Oh, thank you. Um, um, I, I think what Tom was just saying was really interesting about um, using the acronym, even though it's not a particularly loud affiliated project. And I think that's, that's probably a better kind of ground up way of thinking about it, really, um, of sort of aligning yourself with these practices rather than necessarily collecting everything together. Although I think there has often been a tendency to do that with sort of varying results. And... Also, there is quite a lot of desire for, for projects to be collected together. And that's part of what we're doing is with the Plagios registry activity um, for um, linked data, linked humanities geodata um, <coughs> initiatives. Um, we're hoping to um, launch a platform where people will be able to explore those, but not sort of collect them as such, but link out to them. Um, and perhaps a similar thing could be done, sort of tagging for, for loud projects. Perhaps. I, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm probably biased here because I work in Wikidata uh, a lot, but I also think that there's maybe a role for, for Wikidata here as something that is a, a common place that other standards and uh, those ground up projects are linking to. And so uh, it can create kind of a connective tissue between different standards and uh, whatnot. I think it's worth also mentioning, um, so the, the behind the background then, of course, we're using this acronym, or Tom was using the acronym LOUD, and you know, well done for that. Um, that's very much taken from Rob Sanderson, who is also behind the linked art um, uh, model, and also the new, I think it's called Lux Collections, is that right, from Yale, which is um, an attempt by Rob's group now in Yale to show linked data in action using the using Yale's you know, massive and very varied collections, and I think that's great. I think w one thing that um, occurs to me is that it's important for these different groups working on linked data to be linked. <laughs> I mean, that, that sounds maybe just a bit I don't know basic or banal, but actually, you know, Rob's doing all this work with link, you know, Getty's linked art vocab, and you know, this amazing uh, new um, uh, user interface for searching linked data. And what was particularly impressive, um, so Rob did a, a demonstration to the Pelagios network last year. One thing that was particularly impressive was how not only um, was he leveraging connections between the various different collections within Yale, but also drawing upon information outside of Yale. So really using the power of linked data, and I thought that was, that was really impressive. Sarah's mentioned Arches as another platform that enables you to produce linked data. Obviously, Pelagios, we have our own version of producing linked data through Recogito. I think one thing that is... Um, uh, still a challenge, is for these various different groups producing linked data, even if it's specifically linked data around issues, you know, entity of place, for these communities, uh, these tools to be somehow connected. So you can have uh, pipelines or workflows between these different tools, or cons being able to consume um, the, 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 um, the, the different outputs from those tools. So that's still very much, I think, um, a desirability. Um, and that's only going to happen if we talk to each other. So I believe there's um, a couple of questions Sorry now. Sorry to in your steal dis your chair hat for the moment, but since you were talking, I, I've moved here for the questions.
you can um, introduce yourself first. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm Burak Demirci. I'm an MA student in digital humanities at the University of Vienna. I've just started learning about linked open data, and to me, it's not quite clear. I think you have touched upon it a little bit. Why make a new database um, like you have um, when we could just use uh, Wikidata? What is the advantage of it? That is not clear to me. And the second question I have is, which language do you use to query? Is it Spark? Is it Sparkle? Thanks. So the first question is quite easy to answer. The project started 15, no, 17 years ago now. And Wikidata wasn't as famous as it is now. Maybe if we would now have to rethink the project or the design of the project, we could just go for a Wikibase and, and align to other existing uh, projects. Um, your second question, no, we don't have a Sparkle endpoint. So at the moment, um, there are endpoints, different endpoints for APIs that point to some of the portals, not all of them. Uh, the geo relations one is one that is connected to the, to the Gazetteer directly. Um, but there are plans for the future to also make the other uh, portals available. As to Sparkle, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I know that there are um, many issues with Sparkle endpoints, or there have been in the past. I know the Wikidata one is quite, I think, a useful example because that seems to be very, uh, very good, very user friendly. It also doesn't require you to uh, know everything about Sparkle with this uh, user interface. So, um, yeah, we might think about maybe at some point also uh, opening the data up via Sparkle endpoint, but not at this moment. Can I just say something quickly about Wikidata too? So the, the couple of projects, um, actually more than a, a couple of the partners in Plagios are working precisely with Wikidata and I think your group are. Um, my project that I'm working on, on Pausanias, we're also contributing to Wikidata where possible or um, drawing from Wikidata IDs. I think it's worth saying that you, um, I guess there's um, a practical issue and a conceptual issue. And let me see which one's the, which, one's which here off the top of my head. So the, um, I guess the practical issue is um, the idea that there's going to be one thing that can do everything. Uh, so Wikidata for sure is important and it will become more important the more scholars engage with it. So that's the first thing to say. But on the other hand, there are probably limitations to you know, scaling that up. Um, and also, um, there's the conceptual issue that linked data works really well when you have individual groups producing the linked data. So again, not thinking of one you know, aggregator, let's say, or one portal, but different communities publishing their work as linked data that can then be interconnected. So, I mean, maybe a very good example, and I'm looking at Carl here, is the, the World Historical Gazetteer with this kind of satellite of different uh, gazetteer communities and data sets, but are somehow interconnected to each other. So that, I think, is the real power of linked data. And for sure, Wikidata is going to be increasingly one of the key players, but I don't think it's the only one. And so, yeah. There's a question here. Um, in the in the case of our project, um, in terms of the data model, um, because it's um, the data model is based around events, it's very rich and nuanced and complex, and I don't think it's something that would easily map onto Wikidata. Although we are conscious of the importance of Wikidata, and we want to align the entities within our database to Wikidata as far as possible. Um, similarly, we're also developing an ontology of scientific apparatus, and that's something that we are definitely making sure that we link into Wikidata. We also hope to contribute back to Wikidata anything that's, that doesn't currently align with Wikidata terms. Um, and with regards to um, endpoints, um, I've mentioned we're using Arches, which doesn't have a Sparkle endpoint, and there are also issues with the API. Um, so most of the actual querying of our data is going to have to be on a different front end to our database, which is going back to some of the problems of infrastructure that we were talking about. Anne? Are we ready for another question? Or, or Carl, is your, quest, or is your comment in conversation with this current topic? Is your comment uh, in connection with the current conversation or a different question? Okay. 
We'll come back to you in a second, Alessandro. Be patient. Um, well, on the topic of linked open usable data, um, it's a really clever acronym. Uh, the way I've always thought of it is that linked data isn't really linked data. It is linkable data. So if you publish data that somebody might find, then it's linkable. Rob had the idea, well, it should be usable, which to me means there should be an API that makes it accessible. And Trismegistil certainly fits that bill. If you have place data that uh, you would like to make linkable and usable and allowed, you can consider contributing it to World Historical Gazetteer, which um, is a project that I've been building and the technical director of with a small team for several years. Um, we have a poster. I won't say that much more about it because you can go visit the poster a little bit later. Um, I mentioned also that we're in the process of, of accessioning 24,000 of the Trismegistos records uh, into our index to make it that much more usable and findable. You can find things in Trismegistos, but once it's in the World Historical Gazetteer, those individual records will be linked with many other records in a way that isn't possible there. Um, there was something else, but that's probably enough. We can come back to you if you think of it yeah. again, don't worry. Okay, he's been waiting a long time, so let's take this one and then. <laughs> Hi, so yeah, I'm Alessandro Damo with the Bibliotheca Herziano in Rome, just for online, for online prints. Um, I have two questions, actually, if I may. Uh, one, still on the um, loud topic of loud, um, I actually appreciated that uh, you thought of uh, implementing a loud paradigm by, by means of providing APIs, as was discussed, on top of what could already be provided by the default Lintet API, so to speak. And um, if you think of it, one of the stars of the loud model is that uh, it should be comprehensible by introspection and usually refers to the ontology. You should be able to understand the ontology without having to inspect its documentation. So too, uh, if you consider the ontology should be considered both an API and a human interface, then you move to the API uh, context per se, and you're basically looking into providing a non-human interface as a way of making the data more usable, which is very interesting. And I was wondering, uh, Tom, what considerations uh, did you make? What were your, basically the keystones for uh, designing the API? Maybe its endpoints, it's how it accesses resources, its documentation, so that you would be able to say that having the API makes your data loud. Yeah, also this is actually, um, in a way, thanks to the, the Pelagios community, um, because we received um, these kind of questions for the first time, if I remember well, in 2017, 2018, when uh, Gabriel Boddard, who was then still at uh, King's College, organized this um, unconference, he called it. So it was what you could also call a hackathon where um, some colleagues, mainly dealing with um, ancient place names, gathered and all came with their collection, with their gazetteer, with their project. And we just ran a bunch of questions or we, we uh, asked each other like how can we connect our data better and from one thing came another uh, so we started with the um, epigraphic database of Heidelberg with um, uh, Frank Grieshaber who was the developer back then and we developed a custom uh, API for his needs back then for to link the specific um, place names from his uh, database of inscriptions to uh, the Trismegistos Gazetteer but then also other pro projects approached us and we decided to just make it into a general API with an endpoint and adding all the, the partners that we were already collecting partially ourselves, partially because they were sent to us, they were already aggregated somewhere. Wikidata has been very helpful and also the World Historical Gazetteer will. And I think by now we have some um, 60, 65 projects uh, linked to uh, the Gazetteer, and this has only been expanding. Like, I think we add uh, new partners on a on a weekly or monthly basis. Um, so, 
that's how it very organically grew for our project. But I can imagine that if you would start such a thing now, you would maybe immediately look at, at Wikidata or at a kind of niche uh, aggregator for your specific project. Yeah, we would. Thank you. And uh, the second question is actually, Joanna, um, I go, going back to the, uh, the mappings uh, to AAT, which I've seen in the spreadsheet, which already was discussed before. Um, I'm involved in a project which has a very similar task um, of actually mapping AAT um, members to uh, liturgical furnishings, which can be found in churches, uh, in, like in medieval churches of southern Italy. And we have come across uh, a more than a couple of instances where we couldn't really directly map to the AAT, although we could find one uh, example there that could be mapped, theoretically, uh, as examples include like the, the screens, the choir screens and the chancel screens that are found in churches, uh, or, <coughs> or the lofts, the choir lofts, the, um, the organ lofts, and the organ loft doesn't really apply because it's not medieval. So we couldn't, although we could have mapped, we didn't because it doesn't functionally map to what we need to represent in the context of the research project. I was wondering if you have come across similar cases where uh, although the entity in AT exists, but you couldn't map to it for your uh, use cases or, and how you dealt with it. So this is a great question, and essentially uh, the answer is that we are marking them as edge cases to discuss it exactly with, with Yeti and to um, you know, raise it as an issue, and they are open to ingesting uh, from us and, and uh, you know, um, uh, what's the word that I want? Uh, working on a solution um, based on these edge cases. I think right now there's just not enough folks who are pointing to those kinds of gaps in the, um, in the infrastructure. So this is why collaboration is so important. So uh, I, I don't know if you have been in touch with them uh, about uh, the mappings that, that you're doing because I think that that would be uh, really welcome. And I know that Miranda in particular, uh, because Manor al Athar works so much with um, uh, photographic imagery of uh, Byzantine structures and whatnot. I'm sure that she uh, has some vocabulary that, that is uh, of a specialized type that, that she would be really interested in what your project has done. So thank you. My project lead is indeed in contact with the Getty for possibly improving upon the AT, but I think in a rather cursory way compared to maybe how you're dealing with it. Um, just one very quick uh, follow-up. Did you ever find mappings uh, to enter this in Wikidata where you couldn't in AAT because we have a couple of uh, edge cases. We could find Wikidata entities that just didn't have a corresponding in AAT. I would have to, to ask our uh, Syrian uh, collaborator who, who has more contact with, with the Wikidata entities. Um, so I don't have a, uh, an answer for you, but <laughs> wonderful. Further questions from the... Okay. <laughs> Questions from the chat. Thank you. Yeah, we, we gave up both microphones, so <laughs> we're stuck with that one. Um, we have one question uh, that is pretty general about what are the additional costs, time, manpower of becoming a Pelagios participant? Are there any benefits? Oh, are there only benefits? <laughs> So I'll just say that again, because I think Anne didn't get this, and you might, you might want to also answer this. What are the additional costs, time, man, in terms of time, or manpower, et cetera, of becoming a Pelagios participant, or are there only benefits? <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Maybe, uh, yeah, why not? As a kind of answer that we aren't formally part of Pelagios, but... Um, by virtue of the people who worked on the project, of course, especially Valeria, being so central to the Pelagios project, brought a lot of expertise and, and, and sort of 
um, ambition, right, to reuse and think about sustainability and collaboration around annotation. And, and Reiner uh, then was also um, part of the team and absolutely fundamental to thinking about, you know, specifically with maps as the sources that we're trying to, to think with, uh, the next steps for, for Recogito. And it's, I think, um, all that to say that this is the kind of thing that, I think there's a spectrum, right, of it being completely unplanned and unexpected to actually doing the kinds of things that are very Pelagio C without actually uh, formally <laughs> saying that you're doing that. Um, and, you know, things like uh, working across disciplines, yes, it might take more time, but I think that we have better research and tools and um, uh, our, our, our tools have uh, more longevity because of that. So I think that the, the kind of payoff for working in this way and coming to events with these people and having these conversations is really huge, even if it means that an individual task might take a little bit longer. If anyone else wants to say anything. We, okay. um, I think as a partner, um, there really isn't too much additional time or effort if you're doing it right. I mean, the, the whole idea is to join because there will be something for you in it, actually. It's not, you know, what you can do for Pelagios, but what Pelagios can do for you, to misquote somebody. Um, and the, the whole process, in a way, um, is formalized in the way of becoming a partner. So, in fact, there are two ways of being part of a, the Pelagios community. One is just simple membership, by which we, we basically mean an, a listserv. So there's just an email that goes about with various you know, job announcements or interesting conferences or perhaps white papers to contribute to, something like this. That's, you know, that's as low level as you can get in a way in terms of community engagement, but nonetheless, I think quite important. To become a partner, I was talking about before about it being a, a formalized process. That's done through what's called a mem what we've called a memorandum of understanding. So that's essentially a work plan or a plan of work that you would be undertaking anyway, um, relating to your project or a particular work that you're doing for your institution or, or, or whatever, and then articulating how that work plan aligns with the various activities of the Pelagios network, whether that's you know, one particular activity or all of the activities. We, we generally discourage people from signing up to all the activities because if things are working, the activities will be meeting, let's say, once every couple of months. And that means you'll be having an additional meeting, let's say, more or less once every week, which is probably a little bit more work than you had anticipated. But yeah, this is all to say that to become a partner, it's really, there's very, that we've tried to keep the barrier of entry very low, while at the same time putting the onus on activity. So this idea of having a moment of random understanding, we're not going to come, it's, there's no cost involved, we're not going to send the heavies around at midnight to, you know, demand, you know, payment for what you promised. I mean, it's up to you if you get it done or not. But the point is that you've at least gone through the steps of thinking about what your work is about and how that could possibly um, relate to, contribute to, benefit from, add to Pelagios. Where, so that, I think there's, there's all benefit, you know, there, there's no downside. Where it becomes more of an issue is when you go up the, 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 the hybrid of the food chain, as it were, when you become um, a coordinator. So this is just to say, I mean, this sounds, a, I guess this is going to be very boring, so I'll try and keep this brief. It's, it's how Plagios is, is governed. So every, all partners are equal. I guess you could say more, some partners are more equal than others because you have the opportunity to become a coordinator of an activity. Now, the, the, the positive aspect of that is you then get, to a certain extent, to determine what that activity discusses um, over the course of the next year or next couple of years, what it chooses, what kinds of activities relevant to that particular you know, grouping, whether that's gazetteers or annotation or visualization, whatever, what, it, what those core activities um, would be. So that's, if you like, the, you can get, you can 
direct things according to where your interests are. That's how we sell it to, to, to the rest of the partners to try to encourage them to become coordinators because the downside is, of course, this requires organization. So that, I would say, is where the cost is in terms of time um, re relating to coordinators or indeed the officers who oversee the whole operation of Pelagios. Now, none of this is, uh, you know, on the one hand, of course, none of this is paid, so this is t stuff you're doing in your own time. But on the other hand, it should be stuff that's related to the kind of work that you're doing anyway. Um, but it's a commitment. And so, for whatever reason, sometimes activities don't meet uh, for you know, up to six months, say, because, just simply because the, act the, uh, the activity coordinators are too busy. This is where it's really important that the, the decentralized model that Pelagios has always tried to promote, in decentralization in terms of data, in terms of tools, in terms of method, but also in terms of community, where, every, where everybody is equal and everybody has a role in the community. So that's really quite critical. And what I would say, finally, is that it's interesting that of the, the core, let's say, Pelagios uh, team who were running Pelagios when it was a project and we, we were all getting paid, there's only me and Valeria left in terms of positions of, of authority. So that, I think, is a good example of how other people have come on uh, into the former running of Pelagios and taking it on into new directions. And a lot of the, actually, a lot of the heavy lifting, hopefully, is kind of one-time stuff or a bit like spring housekeeping, you know, things to do with updating the website, you know, think kind of again boring stuff, but it needs to be done now and again. So I think once the systems are in place, that can also help then take the load off of the, the coordinating aspect. So there is, you know, there is a commitment, there is a time commitment, but I, th I think I'm speaking for everybody to say that we get much more out of it because you are working with a community that has expertise and um, experience, and you get your stuff done a lot quicker and cheaper as well um, than if you were starting from scratch. Oh, actually, oh, maybe I should get. Uh, you're going to go? Okay. We're just sharing. We're sharing the microphone around. You know, it's, we're, we're kind of that. <laughs> we we roll like that. Many thanks. Uh, this has been very interesting. Uh, my name is David. I'm co-developing the Chevis Tree uh, initiative. Um, so I have one thing I wanted to uh, add maybe to this discussion before on loud and uh, this understandable of linked open data and then the importance which was mentioned already like to also then make available the ontology um, used and I wanted to, to ask how you do that uh, if you have like uh, explicit or implicit uh, uh, ontologies in some of your tools like Recogito. Um, I know there's, for example, the Ontomy platform that is uh, maintained by the people from Lara in, Fra in France. If you use this kind of tool to make it uh, publicly available, your ontology. And that was one question. And the other question, now you, you detailed already a little bit on what I wanted to ask in terms of um, what it would mean to become a member of your, of your community. Um, but on the other side, I imagine that your community, is th that you still have some, some needs, right, to maintain the tools which are, are, like you said, it's distributed. You have the tools with different, maybe with different uh, actors within the, uh, your network, but still there needs to some kind to be a guarantee that those tools continue to be maintained. Uh, so how do you make that uh, happen? How is that part of the MOUs you mentioned, or how does that work? Okay, they're really good questions. Um, let me... So first, yeah, do you want to have a quick, uh, let me, let me back me away. <laughs> okay, give it back, give it back. <laughs> I, I shouldn't. <laughs> all right, sorry. Um, okay, so, so first of all, the ontologies, yeah, this, this is a great question. So, um, Recogito publishes, so one of them, I, I guess, advice, so let's take, a, let's take a step back. So Recogito was developed um, when Pelagios was a project when there was core funding. And so that, remember, finished 2019. It's still going. It's sitting somewhere on the Austrian Institute of Technology servers. I think they've forgotten about it. Reiner, who was the main developer, um, 
uh, since the, he's, he's now too busy to work for them uh, through, I think, Pelagios' work. So he's now um, totally independent. But Regogito, um, the old record, is still sitting there. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I, was getting, I was getting to that. Um, but one of the, the, um, uh, the important things to say about Reco, I, so I talked about Regogito uh, briefly this morning in the Pausanias panel, and I said, one core aspect is it's really easy to use. You know, even a fool like me can, can use this. The other really important thing about Regogito is that you know, from the beginning we were very conscious about it. Um, it's an annotation platform, and you want to get your annotations out. So, and, and Reiner was you know, really very clear on the standards that, that uh, you would then be publishing out into. So that goes from the most basic thing. So if you want, you can get your, and this is actually, I, and I say this because this is the standard that I can use, you can get your uh, data out, your annotations out in CSV. So I, I, even I know how to use a CSV file. So, you know, I can see that nice spreadsheet. That's really helpful for going through the data tidying up and stuff like that. So uh, the very basic stuff, you get your data in CSV, but also publishing in other formats, one of which is the, the web annotation format. Uh, it's a GeoJSON um, uh, version, and I think it's called linked. Is it, that, that's linked places, right? Yeah, the linked place. So it's a thing called the linked places format that Reiner developed in coordination with Carl. That's to do with the place information. And there's also another related format. And excuse us, we, we, we've, um, we haven't been too clever with the, the, the typology here or labeling because it's, it's a bit too close. There's a linked traces format, which is also native to Recogito, also web annotation, and that's to do with the object information. So linked places, you can find this on GitHub. Linked, so it's all published ontology. So linked places is the gazetteer, if you like, format, the place information. The traces is more complex because it's to do with the objects themselves that are being annotated. Uh, so not necessarily the, the, the place. Um, but these are native formats to Recogito. And the other thing to mention um, that could be relevant or interesting in this context, in, again, something I mentioned in my talk this morning on Pausanias, was a tool that we rebooted called Periplayo. Um, so if you think of Recogito as the, con uh, the production of linked data, or let's say web, um, semantic annotation, enables you to do semantic annotation, Periplayo is the consumption of that. And what's nice about it is that that consumes natively Recogito's web, out, um, web annotation format. So it's not, it's not seamless yet. That needs to be developed because it's all to do with um, that second question about you know, time, money, hosting, which I'm going to come, come to in a second. But, it is, but there is a pipeline between annotating in Recogito and then visualizing your annotations in Periplayo. And also, Periplay has now been extended to other, um, other interest groups, such as museums and collections, who have got collection data. So there's a kind of a Periplay for people like me, who, who like uh, geographic information in text, but there's also a Periplay for collections as well. This is all you know, good standard um, web data formats. Um, and on the subject of Periplay, and this, this that now uh, hopefully is a nice segue into your second question about how do you develop all this stuff or keep it going, that's, that is the real challenge because we aren't funded. You know, Pelagios has, I'll reiterate re, 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 that again, Pelagios has no funding. How sustainability works then is diffused through the network. So individual partners help contribute to that. And basically it's, sustainability through reuse, actually through tools, through standards being continually developed and involved, then you get sustainability actually. So a very good example is Periplayo. Periplayo, like Recogito, had been developed when uh, Pelagios was a project with core funding. It was, that was developed back in 2017 and it was developed as a showcase of what you can do with linked data. So Recogito, we, we'd already started with Recogito. We were, as a project, we were working 
uh, with multidisciplinary teams to roll this out from beyond the ancient world through to the kind of the modern period. And we wanted to be able to kind of showcase to people, kind of give them a, um, a shop window, as it were, um, look at the exciting stuff you can do if your data is published as, as linked data. So that's where Perry Playo came in. The problem was it became quite um, attractive and successful. And that was a problem because people started coming to us to say, hey, we really like Perry Playo. Can we get our data into it? And to begin with, we were flattered. I guess that people had taken interest. Hey, look, yeah, there's, uh, people, are, people are excited by it. But of course, that then became a hosting issue because we didn't have the money to host anything like that. And it is also kind of against the principles of linked data, as we were conceiving of it, where linked data is this distributed system. We didn't want to be the, we didn't want to be the home. We didn't want to be the portal. We didn't want to be the aggregator. And yet we were becoming that through the popularity of Perry Player. So Reiner, who is much cleverer than any of us, said, no, no, that's enough. We're not doing Perry Player anymore. So that was it. But I always liked the, the design of it. I liked the ability to be able to search through uh, information through a map, I thought as a, the, using the map as a powerful tool of investigation and searching through collections or, or textual data. So on this project that is funded, this Pausanias project, I convinced the principal investigator that we should be looking to a web, uh, uh, a lightweight web application, not a GIS, but something that was able to represent text alongside map. I thought that would be a really good way of visualizing our annotations and enabling search and analysis. So, and I mentioned this before in my talk this morning, we went to Ryan and we paid him £4,000 to reboot Perry Play. So this is, this is peanuts, right? Um, we paid him £4,000 to reboot Perry Play as now something that each individual project or person could point their browser to. So not a Perry Play that we were hosting, but a Perry Play that you would host. So if you were interested in these particular linked open data sets, you, you, um, you could then have your own pay player for that. And so that worked really nicely for our project, just as a kind of a pilot. And it then got picked up by another Plagios partner, I actually kind of looked at that from a very different field from actually for the British Library, who was interested at the time to visualize collection data sets. And go, hey, that would be a really good tool. For, for us, and so he's, that's Gethin Rees, um, a Plagios partner, and he has since not only developed Perry Player further, but also has written a, a brief a tutorial on GitHub, so has made it a lot easier for other people to do it. So this is, this is a sustainability, this is tool development, not through one project, but through a series of projects, and in fact, we're in discussion currently with um, Reiner and um, a non-for-profit non organization in the state, software company in the states, called Performance Software, who are another Plagios partner, who are in contact with lots of US uh, projects that are funded by the NEH. And there were and the, a number of these projects are also interested in geospatial analysis and linked data. And they are thinking of developing again con um, further the tools that we have that would both suit their clients, you know, do the stuff that their clients want more cheaply because they're building on software and at the same time leaving behind that software in a better state for the rest of the community. So, you know, it, I hope, I mean, I realize I was talking uh, for quite a long time there, but I think this is an interesting and I think potentially new way of going about sustainability and, and sustainability has always been the problem with DH projects so far as I can. As soon as the money tap is switched off, what do you do? So I think is I think it's worthwhile trying, because there's a great question, trying to unpack this. And so I'm gonna go back to the Recogito thing, actually. So Recogito, you, it, you can still use it. It's sitting there on the, the AIT's, uh, this isn't being live streamed, is it? Uh, it's, it's sitting on the AIT's servers. Um, of course, you can also host your own Recogito. So that, again, takes away that issue. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly possible. But it's also worth saying that Reiner has been working on another annotation tool with performance software for an Austrian uh, project. Is that in Graz even? Or Vienna? Anyway, it's in Austria. It may even be in Graz. I, I, I really ought to know that. But Reiner doesn't tell me everything. Um, and that is 
you, you can think of that as recogito light at the minute, but it's going to, it's, it's basically, he's now gone, he's, he's liked how the Perry Player model has worked, and he's now developing that for recogito. So again, this lightweight thing that people can kind of, almost like you can build, continually build on top of it by being very lightweight and, and encourage people to uh, all have a stake in it, as it were. So, so I re again, I, I understand that was a very long response, but they, they were very good questions, so I thought it was, it was kind of worthwhile. Someone else has a go with this. Yeah. So first, I thank you for you all. And I actually, I just uh, participated in the Linked Past 8 uh, last year in at York, and I was really inspired by the event, and I got funded to host the Linked Past Japan. Uh, so we will be having- Congratulations, well done. Yeah, conference on October or November. So, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. But anyway, uh, you showed me. Uh, you showed us the maps of the partners uh, thing at the, the very beginning of this uh, session. So, is there uh, how many like um, institutions, not from Europe or the United States, will be in this network? So that it's kind of like a yeah. That that's a really great question. Um, any? Do we have any sense of non? I don't know. That's really good. Le Leaf, you, you, you looked as though you were going to say something. Sure, uh, uh, microphone, microphone. <laughs> Leaf, I should say, is one of the founders of Pelagios and now just sits in the audience, okay, kind of smiling. <laughs> I thought I got smiling. away with that. There's like literally 55 seconds until the... Uh, uh, well, I was going to say, well, Sinai, obviously, I mean, it depends how you define Europe and whatever, but, you know, Israel has been a big, this, yeah, we've had a you know, number of, of partners. Um, there have also been from uh, Africa. Um, I think it was kind of Coptic. Latin America, too. Uh, Latin America, yeah. Um, so it's not, I mean, definitely. Turkey, yeah. Turkey. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's always room for significant improvement. We could definitely go to Japan. That'd be, that'd be great. I'm so. very, I'm very <laughs> excited about, uh, about that, especially since, uh, yeah, we can go to Tokyo with, uh, you know, with DH, so... Um, anyway, but yeah, I mean, we didn't talk a lot about Link Past, but Link Past was a, a, a spin-out initiative from, from Pelagios, so um, more or less every year, um, in person or hybrid, um, that's been an opportunity to bring really a whole group of people with a similar outlook, uh, but without the emphasis on geospatial, um, but looking at, at light wing, sort of light, lighter weight uh, linked open data methods for, for yeah, bringing different initiatives together. Uh, and um, yeah, that's, that's brilliant news, uh, Jin. So, um, well, yeah, hopefully hear more about that in, in due course, but that's, yeah, it's great. Yeah, do keep us posted. We'd be really, really interested and, um, and feature that, you know, if possible. We'd certainly like to, you know, advertise it. Um, I guess there's time for w one last question, or maybe not even. Agiati, can I say about the, the news that you had? Is that possible? <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, then we'll, we'll leave that. It's good news. It's, it's good news. <laughs> okay, that, well put. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say one final thing about maintenance and sustainability and how do we conceive of this going forward after a project comes to an end. We face this problem on Machines Ready Maps too. Uh, and I just want to say that I think, obviously, one of the things that, as I've been attending Link Pass and being a part of projects that are using these tools, uh, and learning from everyone is just the importance of advocating uh, for uh, larger infrastructure uh, possibilities, whether those are institutional, national, international, and um, and a lot of places in the world don't have that, and there's a lot of work to do. So, uh, yeah, everywhere, <laughs> um, and even somewhere like the UK, uh, which is small, uh, really lacks national digital humanities infrastructure uh, that would make figuring out how to maintain these tools that have broad reuse uh, useful. And there's a, just putting the, saying that there's lots of energy that we need to invest there, as everyone in this room knows, but we're saying.
Thanks very much, Katie. It's good. That was a really important point to make. And another last important point to make is we, there's one presentation that we weren't able to listen to because of lack of time. That was by Shine Orley. It's a really interesting presentation too. That is currently being shown on the slides. There is also an open Google Doc where all the abstracts are and we'll make, we can put the link there, right? So that um, that's been widely shared already. So I would recommend um, listening to what they have to say. Their talk was a little bit too long, unfortunately, for this session, but you know, I think there's, they put a lot of work into it, and I think it's only right to say that you know, it's, uh, it's, it'd be really great to, to listen to them. So thank you to them. Thank you to the other online Plagios people who contributed to this. Thank you to uh, my fellow panelists here. And above all, thank you to the audience for such, I mean, you really write down to the world. I didn't get to leave until the last minute. So that tells you how interesting the discussion was. So, so thank you, everybody. <laughs>